Special Operations. Covert Ops. Espionage. The Team House. With your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hey, everyone. Welcome to episode 252 of the Team House. I'm Jack Murphy. My co-host, Dave Park, is out tonight. He'll be back next week. Um, thank you for joining us. It's been a, uh, it feels like it's been a long spell since the holiday break, so I'm, I'm glad to be back. Uh, our guest on tonight's show is Mike Holterman. Mike served for 20 years in the Marine Corps, uh, was part of the standing up of MARSOC, uh, and all kinds of other interesting stuff we'll get into. And he also works with the Honor Foundation. Uh, helping uh, transitioning veterans. So we're going to talk about all of that as well. So, Mike, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Hell yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely, man. It's, it's great to have you here. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'll start off the, the interview the way we start off almost all of them, asking about your origin story. If you could tell us a little mm -hmm. bit about, like, how you grew up and how that took you towards a path of military service. Yeah, so I was a small town kid. I uh, grew up in a really small town on the central coast of California. Uh, central coast of California is like the dead zone between LA and San Francisco. No one's ever heard of it uh, unless you unless you grew up there. Um, it's very different, right? It's not like the rest of California. It's uh, it's uh, a lot of red, white, and blue, and football, and and uh, backyard barbecues. So I grew up doing that, but it was also California, so I got to surf a lot too, and uh, ride skateboards. And, you know, what I realized was, although I lived in a cool, small town, I, it was small and my life was going to be small. And if I was going to stay there, that was I kind of saw the writing on the wall. And so as I finished high school and all those things, um, I wanted, you know, I want to go adventure, young man stuff. Yeah, you want to yeah. go see the world, go travel. Uh, and I had a couple of buddies who had joined the Marine Corps. And I thought, well, man, if those guys could do it, I could probably do that, too. Um, and so, you know, I found myself following suit, uh, joining the Marine Corps in 1998 and, uh, joined more or less right after high school as I, I was early, uh, late teens, early twenties. And, um, man, it was the exact thing I needed at the right time in my life. Uh, I was a bit of a wayward child. I wasn't great in high school. Um, and the discipline, the, you have to get up at this time and you're doing this and this is your job was was what i needed at that time plus i got to play with guns and i got to make a lot of new friends um so that was pretty cool so i found myself um going through boot camp and uh in san diego uh and then they're like hey so you're from california let's go ahead and send you uh to north carolina right so i had more or less did my first five years in north carolina which was great uh because i never would have you know been in a platoon or been around you know, a bunch of kids from New York, a bunch of kids from the South, a bunch of guys from Miami, you know, and from all these different places. And so you're thrown into this mix of America and it's just a great growth opportunity, learning new culture, learning new, uh, interesting, different perspectives on life. And then learning how to survive the infantry is young e nothings together, uh, where you're you're being challenged, I'll say, in the in the late nineties, uh, late nineties, early two thousands. A lot of tree lines, and uh, a lot of things happened in those tree lines. And um, you know, I, in the first four years, I made such good friends. I was like, yeah, I could do this for twenty years, no problem. Uh, I was having a great time. Yep. Uh, those first uh, that first enlistment in the Marine Corps uh, during quote unquote peacetime. I, mm -hmm. What what was that like for you? I mean, what was there? Uh, you know, do you go on training to like Okinawa? I mean, I know the Marines definitely get around a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a lot of travel. It was. Um, <clears throat> I think we'd only, you know, I checked in and it was like, hey, you're going straight to the field, and we started doing uh, nuclear, biological, chemical Fun. warfare training like immediately. Like that was the very first thing. Uh, getting gassed, getting gassed in the in the fleet. Uh, as a young infantryman is way different uh, than all of the safety protocols that they put on in boot camp. So that was uh, that was an uphill learning experience, but uh, builds character. And uh, <laughs> so being a young infantryman, uh, a lot of a lot of travel to places we probably don't go to as much anymore, Greece um, and a couple of other spots uh, off that I can't really recall off the top of my head. But what we did a lot of, shining boots because we had the old black 
boots that you shined and uniform inspections uh, and a lot of standing in formation waiting for the word. Right. So what do, what are we doing tomorrow? You know, and then, okay, throw your PTs on and go PT. So, I mean, you're having a hell of a good time in the Marine Corps, it sounds like. You're deciding you want to do this for a career. And then yeah. it must have been around, uh, I'm guessing, around the time when you re-enlisted that 9-11 happened. Yeah. So I'm out. Um, I'm on the USS Kearsarge. And we are floating around the Mediterranean. And somewhere around, I guess, July, August, they drop us off in Kosovo. Because Kosovo was the hot thing still going on. Uh, so we we go into Kosovo and we're going to do uh, interdiction operations on the Macedonian border, make sure drugs and monies and things are not going one way and, you know, guns and human uh, slaves are not going the other way and all of those things. So first real world op um, and we're setting up defensive positions. We're kind of out in the hinterlands doing kind of old school infantry stuff, patrol based operations. And um, I'm patrolling around. I've, I'm, I'm literally taking out my very first patrol for the first time. We had been there a couple of weeks, and it's my first uh, PL lead. And uh, we had a call across the radio that's, America's been attacked, return to base. And I'm like, come on, man. You're messing with me. Nobody, nobody attacks America. Like, come on. And they're like, no, seriously, return to base. And so I'm thinking, you know, I get the boys together. We all take a knee face outboard. I'm like, all right, drink water. We're going to hump it back. We're going to move pretty quick. Sure enough, we get back to our little patrol base and it's already being torn down. Army 47s are coming in. We're taking platoons out. My platoons, one of the last ones to leave, takes us back to Bond Steel. And the Bond Steel chow hall is just raucous. Every time you walk in there, it's Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, all of the K-4 forces. It's loud. Just all kinds of nonsense going on. We, I crack the door open, and I'm still thinking, like, this is crazy. Like, what's the real story here? I crack the door open, and you could hear a pin drop. And so we slide in quietly, and they have these big old-school TVs, and it's just the repeat over and over again of the planes flying into the towers. And it was just – it's surreal. And just to see, like, two, 200, you know, uh, guys and gals in uniform just in complete silence – like no one's even serving food or anything. We're all just standing there in shock. Um, jump back on the cure Sarge and uh, we're like, okay, we're already out here. What, what are we doing? What, where's the fight we're right, getting into? Right. And, um, but it happened to be right at the end of our deployment. The next Mew had already spun up. They had already done their final exercises and stuff. And they're like, no, nope, you're steaming home. Uh, the next Mew is going to come out and whatever happens next is it's going to be uh, their game to play. Uh, so I steamed home, uh, not knowing what was going to happen next. Uh, we were home a couple of months, and um, commander started saying things like, you know, be prepared. You're probably going to find yourself in a desert here shortly. So, you know, let's start getting our things in order. Uh, make sure you know where all your stuff is. You know, Will's power of attorney started happening and all of those things. And then, yeah, 2003, we we found ourselves in the desert of Kuwait. Wow. Uh, staring north going man is this really happening yeah I, I mean could you could you expand on that a little bit like as a as a young marine and like you're about to push across the the berm line right yeah yeah and it was uh so you know at the e5 level nobody's telling you nothing especially back then and it, it's not like i'm able to just jump on a red side and figure some things out that's not even available to me right i'm living in a gp tent sleeping on the desert floor 110, 115 is pretty much the norm for Kuwait around that time of year. And um, we're all just wondering, right? And we're we're in this giant grid square uh, with a berm around us with lots of other units. And we're all just kind of wondering, is this thing really going to happen? And sure, you know, and then we're doing the gas mask drills. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I alluded to my very first training op, ironically, was NBC. Nobody cares until they care because nuclear, biological, chemical is bad, right? So we're doing all the drills, throwing on gas masks, throwing on the Saratoga suits that are green, ironically. And here we are in the in the desert. And um, and then we get the call like, OK, this is the order of March. This is the vehicle you're in. Here's where everyone's going to be. We're driving north. You know, here's here's probably where we're going to stop and so on and so forth. And I remember taking off, you know, zero dark something and driving. And it, we did it for three days, four days, mm -hmm. 
it's been quite a while. I don't really remember how long it was, but it was a long time. Um, driving 24 hours straight, night and day, uh, nonstop, switching out drivers, just keep moving. And massive trains just uh, in parallel of vehicle, American vehicles going over the berm uh, and through the southern deserts. And, you know, even crossing through the berm was pretty surreal because it was literally this giant sand dune of a berm with giant, you know, um, uh, ditches on either side and Constantino wire and all kinds of things that had already been cleared out. And we're going through those breach points. It was, yeah, it was surreal. I mean, what was it like when you, when you crossed over the berm and got into Iraq? And I mean, it's like, this is war. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Is okay. So have I checked the box yet? Is yeah, this, yeah. is this, did I do it? Do, am, am I doing it? Yeah. It was, it was a lot of that literally. Um, you know, cause what do you have to, you know, thinking back to the movies and the books that were available back then, you're comparing yourself to like commando, Rambo, <laughs> predator, Delta force, you know, Charlie Sheen jumping off the bridge and Navy seals. And you're like, you know, platoon, like, okay, none of this equates, right? Like, what am I actually doing? Um, you know, and then you, you know, a couple days later, uh, with some broken vehicles, you know, and, and all the madness that happens in a really long log train movement, mm -hmm. all of it happened, right? Literally wheels fell off of vehicles because they were just, were just grinding them up with all the weight of all the things we're carrying and, and so on and so forth. And then, uh, there were also times where we would see, you know, Patriot missiles going overhead and gas, 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 like throw everything on, let's go. And we would just be riding around in gas masks for six hours, seven hours, eight hours straight, just waiting for someone to say, like, it's real, it's not real. That was just a really good drill. Good job, buddy. You're still alive, so keep going. Um, and then we pulled into southern Nazaria. And, well, excuse me, before that, we'd, we we gotten just south of the third largest city in, in Iraq, uh, Nazaria. And it was our artillery with... Uh, Iraqi artillery kind of trade rounds back and forth. So we just weren't moving forward. That was the flot at that point, I guess. And um, they're just kind of figuring it out, just throwing rounds back and forth. And we're a truck company. So we moved pretty quickly through the desert. And this is just, I may probably allude to this a few times through my telling of my own story. There's these little moments that happen that at the time you have no idea how impactful it is, but then they become something that is, it, it changes the trajectory of the rest of your life. And so because we had to stop, because those already rounds were getting tossed back and forth between those two units, it allowed an AAV track company to catch up because the AAVs don't move as fast, but they were able to catch up. So when we continue to push forward, the AAVs took our mission to push into the city, which literally saved our lives because they got ate up hard when they hit the city but they were in armored vehicles. So they took a, a, a brunt of that off the armor. Whereas if we would have been in trucks, mm -hmm. that would have been a, that would have been a whole different story about the entirety of Iraq because of the amount of instant casualties that would have happened. Um, and just prior to that. So then, you know, the, the artillery goes back and forth that kind of ceases. They push the tracks up. We kind of follow behind and it's the first time I'm sitting in uh the southernmost portion where we entered was really the, the city dump. And so we're just getting swamped by the flies for the very first time. And you're like, Oh, little did we know that is Iraq. That's, that's what you're going to experience the rest of the time you're here. Welcome, welcome to Iraq. And, uh, it was the first time I saw American vehicles, bullet holes in them on fire, tipped over American uniforms. This was no longer training. This was okay. We're in war now. This is real. And I want to say less than 45 minutes later, we took a contact left and it was one of the coolest things I ever got to be a part of. We dismounted, got online as a company, a rifle company and Holy pushed shit. through. It was just total mayhem, but it looked exactly how it's supposed to look like on range 300 at what, you know, whatever right, complex right, right. where you do that. And I was like, wait, we did it. Like that, that actually went really well. Like, do I still have all my parts? So I'm like, so, like everyone's okay. Ooh, that was cool. So you guys was, did like a, like a bounding overwatch as a company, like moving forward. Yeah. 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 Machine guns, 
60 mortars got out and three wow. mortars in and a whole bit, you know. About how many, uh, who was the, the, op, the op four? I mean, what was the ambushing force composed of? Couldn't tell you. E5, E5 Halty had no idea. I just heard bullets <laughs> come from this way. And he said, contact left. Um, I was an anti-tank assault man, so I'm running around with a 83 millimeter recoilless rocket launcher. And I just remember my company commander saying, that building hit it. Roger that. Yeah. What I, what I forgot during that little piece was, you know, we put in earring protection at the range. Yeah, I went hot with a small uh, for the very first time in combat and didn't put in hearing protection. And I felt like my head, my head was going to melt for about the next three, five days. It was, it was pretty gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then you came to find out, um, if you could tell us a little bit about like what you found out after the fact about like those vehicles mm -hmm. you came across. It wouldn't come together for another couple of weeks. I mean, there was a, you know, beyond that first contact left, there mm -hmm. was some legit gunfights we got to experience. Um, lots more probing the lines as we dug in the defense and kind of held the Southern in Nazaria. Um, and it was a couple of weeks to a month. I mean, the timelines are sketchy now at this point. It's been, you know, a couple decades. Yeah. I'm standing on a rooftop though. And it was, a, this is after the, the major rainstorm where we, I'm on a rooftop again doing firewatch and I'm going to slide off the roof because the amount of rain and those mud buildings are just coming apart underneath us. But a, a couple of days after that, um, we we got intel that some of the survivors of those vehicles were local to the area and they, they were correlating their position and trying to find them in the city. Um, and we had done shaping operations and a couple of other things that I knew I was a part of to just uh, to, to attempt to make that happen. So fast forward, I'm standing on a roof again. It's it's zero two. I'm kind of reflecting on all that experience up to that point. I'm loving my infantry career. I'm reaffirming this is a 20 year thing for me. This is awesome. War is pretty cool as a young man. Uh, it's, it's a mixed bag of emotion, but it's, it's mostly pretty cool. And, um, I see, uh, three tanks and they just face Abrams and they just face their, um, their cannons outboard, go over the bridge and just start lobbing rounds into buildings. Cause it was a free fire zone because of the, the gunfights that had been happening. And I'm like, Okay, I've seen some stuff. Never seen that happen. That's that's a bold move, Cotton. Let's see let's see how that plays out. Uh, some um, some other vehicles start laying out uh, some some pretty heavy twenty five millimeter rounds into the into the city, and then basically what happens next is I hear a C one thirty pull into orbit over a set of compounds, and then the womp 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 of forty sevens and little birds come screaming in, and it just lights off. And it would take me several months after that, fast forwarding, to realize that what I got to watch on a monocle device, so it's not like I was watching it like we're seeing each other right now. It was highly grainy. Um, but I got to see the big muscle movements of essentially the raid to get Jessica Lynch back. Um, and the whole time I'm standing up there, I'm thinking, I'm really enjoying combat. I think I'm actually kind of good at it. And in, in we're performing well. I'm enjoying it. I'm going to do this forever. But whatever that was, <laughs> I've got to go be a part of that. I've never seen anything like that was the coolest stuff ever. And like, I didn't know that SOCOM was a real, like a real thing. I thought it was movies and books and, and all of those things. So that just put me on a completely different path after that. How did the, uh, the rest of that deployment to the, uh, the 2003 deployment to Iraq, how did that continue and, and then eventually wind down for you mm -hmm. it was you know we thought incorrectly up front that you know we had we had defeated the iraqi army uh that we had liberated the people and that so they started exfilling forces um uh, pretty rapidly uh we were probably only there about three months was probably the total total amount of time in country i think i was there and uh, yeah, we exfilled. I got right back on the Kearsarge and, and steamed home uh, yet again. And then it right, it just slowly unfolds and it starts to turn into this meat grinder that just doesn't end. And then I'm thinking, well, put me back in the fight, coach. Get me, get me in there. But I'm also in this career point in the Marine Corps where they're like, hmm, no, 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 no. That's not your, uh, that's not your future. That's not the needs of the Marine Corps. You're going to go be an infantry instructor at the School of Infantry which I also felt pretty, I felt really good about because I was, my experience at the School of Infantry was not a great one. I learned a ton. 
Uh, but I felt there was a lot of room for improvement over what I experienced. And I was excited to go back and give back meaningfully to my, my job field, my MOS. And now that I have combat experience, I've, I've done something, I can bring something relevant. Um, and if this thing's going to continue, I mean, I know that I'm sending these young men straight into it and I'm, I'm a hundred percent in like, if I've got to do this, then all right, let's go. Um, yeah. So that's where I went next. Yeah. I, I mean, you, it sounds like you were pulled in two different directions or maybe more than two. I mean, part of it was that you wanted to get back in the fight, but part of it was also you were realizing how big an impact you were able to make on these young Marines. It was, I mean, I mean, it was, uh, the, the impact portion was in retrospect, right? Yeah. Cause in my early twenties or mid twenties or whatever it was at that point, uh, I didn't have the prefrontal cortex <laughs> at that point to have enough, uh, understanding and, and really think that uh, completely through, but it was it availed itself, I would say, over my time as being an instructor and and the relevance of it was really tough for all the instructor cadre watching like the big things like Fallujah unfold, yeah, and we're getting it, you know, on on the very early version of YouTube and all the other different uh, platforms and things way back when, you know, and so. Tell us about like your pursuit of special operations, and and at the mm -hmm. time, at the time, we have to also mention uh, for viewers that the Marine Corps was not a part of Special Operations yeah. Command at that time. Yep, yep. So, and I knew that I wanted to pursue a different path, and I started really. I had to do the research to figure that out. So I'll also remind everybody: Google didn't exist yet. Uh, so doing the research was actually really tough. Um, SOCOM didn't have a public facing web page. Um, so it was a lot of books and research and talking to a buddy who had done this thing, who had a cousin who was a ranger who, and in all of these conversations, and I figured out, okay, if I was going to get to SOCOM, I was going to have to leave the Marine Corps, um, inter service transfer is an option. And so when you say that as an E5, you don't get treated real well. You, uh, <laughs> it's not, it's not the, the most popular thing to say. And first sergeants uh, will be the first ones to let you know that is not going to happen, in fact. And um, <laughs> there's, there's a whole lot of other things I now have for you to do right now. Uh, yeah, so I got to learn the hard way that um, I was going to have to be a little more strategic about it. Um, and I, I saw the opportunity also going to school of infantry to be an instructor that would lower my op tempo and I could really start to work out harder. And I knew I, I'm a terrible swimmer. So I knew, I, I knew regardless of the selection process, I was aiming towards, I'd have to get better at that. And I'd have to get better rucking and, and all the other gamut of skills. And so I started trying to layer those things on and that allowed me to be, mentally and physically prepared for what eventually happened in 2007 i'm again right time right place and the it's one of those fortuitous moments you just don't know i'd made really good best friends and one of my brothers to this day with another instructor who's very close to a bunch of force recon guys and they by named him over to the unit that was going to become marsoc on the west coast um and he, he by named a couple of other people and I got to be one of those other people. He said, check it out. This is how it works. I'm going to vouch for you one time and the rest is on you. Like, you have to show up and do the work and do the rest, but I'm going to vouch for you this one time. And I was like, all right, let's do it. I'm all in. Cause just before that him and I had already gotten our orders. I knew him and I both knew where we were going. We had already talked to, our infantry platoons that we were going to and the commands and all of those things. And we're like, yeah, we're, we're 60 days out. You know, we're going to, you know, we're going to go do the right thing and say hello first and get acquainted with everybody. And then that way it's a super smooth transition. And then this thing just kind of pops up and uh, we went for it and we had to, we had to do a lot of work to fight the system, to make it all happen, get orders changed. Like that doesn't, that is, that's a rarity I would say. Um, but we got lucky and, uh, and him and I both got to stay for 20 years, which is also very awesome. fortuitous. Yeah. Uh, uh, I want to ask you about the, the birth of Marsoc, but I'm going to give a, a quick uh, shout out to my friend, uh, at Casa Carabeo Cigars. Uh, they keep us well stocked over here. I hope you guys go check them out. Really love what they do. 
uh, casacarabeo.com is, is the website where you can go and get them. And I also just wanted to plug real quick uh, our Patreon. If you guys want to get ad-free episodes of the Team House, $5 a month, uh, you can get all of them ad-free. So please go and check it out. And, you know, we, of course, really appreciate your support, and it keeps the show going. Um, so, Mike, uh, walk us through a little bit about the birth of Mar Marine Special Operations and also, like, your personal experience, what you were kind of going through to get that. Because, I mean, standing up any unit from scratch like that is a huge, huge pain in the ass. Yeah, yeah, but such an opportunity, and I'm I'm yeah. so grateful yeah, yeah. that I got the opportunity to do it. And it was uh, so that as the legend was told to me, old old Donnie Rumsfeld is uh, trolling around uh, the different special operations communities and asking the SOCOM commander, "What else do you need?" And he said, "I need more bodies. Like it's a war." Uh, and he goes, "Okay, well, how do I how do I facilitate that?" And I think he probably kind of said, "Marine Corps is not." You know, Marine Corps is not helping us out none. And uh, I think he pretty much turned to the left and said, hey, Marine Corps, you have X amount of time to get this done. Uh, so um, debt one, the very first yep. uh, SOCOM test unit was stood up. Uh, they went out and they were catastrophically successful is the best way to put it. They, they did some great work uh, that I hope goes down and is chronicled in SOCOM history. And um, especially in, in all of those men who paved the way for us. Um, and so then that happened and they that was the left seat, right seat, essentially. So Com said, yeah, check. That's a check in the box. We'll take them. And um, then the command was stood up uh, on the East Coast and a year later was in 06. And then in 07, uh, the command was stood up uh, first Marine Special Operations Battalion was stood up and I had just showed up. I'm Nick, the new guy, brand new, uh, looking lost and not knowing uh, what to do. And I find myself in formation where they traded the first force reconnaissance guide on for the first Marine Special Operations guide on. Um, and the other thing that happened in that formation that um, really changed my perspective and understanding of what the rest of my career would be like was there was, I don't know, three, four silver stars in that formation. And there was at least as many bronze stars. And I think every single one of those dudes was also getting a purple heart. Plus there was a whole section of other guys getting purple hearts and comms and, and everything's with V's. And it was just, I had done some really cool things in the infantry and I had worked with some of the best infantrymen possible. Some of the best machine gunners that taught me invaluable skills, mortar men, um, and great guys, but now I was definitely in a different place and I was in to hear those citations. It was just like, these are the things of legend and I'm standing in formation with these gentlemen shoulder to shoulder. And I, I realized instantly I'm not working hard enough. I'm not smart enough. So I, I've got to, I've got to fix both of those things as fast as possible. So shut my mouth, listen and do everything as best I can. Could you explain also a little bit about like, you know, this is a brand new unit. I mean, what, what's, mm. what's the, what, what was the mission that, as far as it came down from higher? I mean, you must've had, you, mm -hmm. you know, your mission essential tasks. Um, and how did you go about beginning like training for those and getting prepared eventually for deployment? Mm -hmm. uh, luckily again, I was uh, young enough in my career where I didn't know any of that piece. Uh, I was a staff sergeant by that, by that time and still a very young uh, E6 staff sergeant. Uh, so I was literally just doing what I was told when I was told and doing it to the best of my ability. And when I was asked, how can we do it better or ask for my opinion, I was trying to provide really good feedback. So my experience was more of one of um, go to a school, pack all of your things, because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. as soon as you fail anything, you're gone. You're getting orders and you're leaving. Uh, and so my very initial experience was people would show up to to – um, formations and meetings, and I would never see them again. And then new people would show up and they would be around for a while. And then I would never see them again. And I would go to a school, come back, go to a school, come, go to a training package, come back. And people were just in and out, in and out, in and out because the selection process was pre having a hammered out selection process in, in place. And it was happening at the unit level. Uh, so it was very, uh, uh, it was a free market economy. If you uh, were not playing and putting in, putting in your uh, 
your uh, number of uh, points on the board, man, you were gone. Uh, so that, that happened quite a bit. And so um, that's how I got to experience. And I, I got told more than once, you don't belong here. Um, you're, you're not an 0321 uh, recon Marine. Um, the, this place was built on recon Marine. You're just an infantryman and just make it easy for us, fail something so we can get rid of you. Um, and that got said to us, uh, me and my buddy who vouched for me to get over there, uh, and the master sergeant who said that to us, I don't think he realized the effect that had on us. Cause as soon as he walked away, me and my buddy looked at each other and we didn't have to say a thing. I already knew what he was thinking. You're going to have to kill me yeah, and yeah. drag my dead body out of here. It's like, I'm, I'm here. Um, so that was my initial experience. But then after that, once I kind of earned my place and my ability to have an opinion, um, it was, it was well received and. It was a very entrepreneurial environment, uh, figuring out the uniform, figuring out how to wear what, where, when, and how, and how much. All of those things were being figured out in the moment at the at the ground level. And it was it was a it was really, again, just grateful to be there at that time. Even like what what you guys were going to be called, like now you're Raiders, but I mean, right. it, it it took some time even to get to that, didn't it? It did. So the original unit was Marine Special Operations Battalion because was, the Marine Corps wanted nothing to do with uh, standing up the Raider Battalions again. Um, it's very against the culture of, of uh, the Marine Corps. And so even calling ourselves Raiders was uh, highly um, poo-pooed upon, I would say. Uh, it was, or, or in other words, it was illegal. Uh, so we couldn't use like the skull and stars that you see mm -hmm. behind me. Mm -hmm. Um, guys were getting it tattooed and they were literally getting kicked out of the Marine Corps and out oh, of the unit shit. Wow. for those things, <laughs> yeah, NJPs and all kinds of things. Um, couldn't use Raider. And so it was, it was very much, uh, Marines are who we are. Special operations are what we do. Um, we're, uh, we're more than a one trick pony. We're willing to do windows. Um, and, and I understand why all that was happening. Stay humble, work hard, check, got it. Um, and then over, over the course of a couple more years later, we were able to procure the device, change the name, get an MOS, you know, we didn't even have an MOS up front and then secure the MOS for officers. So they didn't disappear. Yeah. Uh, and they were able to stay as well. So all of those were critical steps in the, in the years following. And how long do you think it took to stand up like your task organization, get all the, uh, the equipment and weapons and everything you need and, and start to go mm. into like that pre-deployment cycle? The GWAP money was flowing in pretty hot and heavy, even from from day one. We were, I mean, just duffel bags of gear and trying out lots of new things. If you're going to sniper school, you got another duffel bag of things to try out. You're going to free fall, another duffel bag. And it was very, okay, this works, this doesn't work, these combinations, things. And we were we were doing that for a lot of the my initial package, my initial workup was probably probably the longest one. At, at about 18 months where it was just our company together doing doing the workup, going to schools and all of those things. Um, it, it contracted considerably after that. Um, and then in terms of the TO, like what does the team consist of? That changed from, we went from a three, four team model, excuse me, four team, uh, three, four team, four element model to a three team model, just like deployment after deployment, we're changing the model, changing the model. Um, and in terms of, as I rose to the ranks, understanding enablers when they're mm -hmm. added, um, who was added, how many were added, that changed considerably. So the construct of the entire company, um, it was just an ever-changing model, I would say, up until about 2016. Then it got very solidified and it became uh, very, yeah, in stone at that point. And I'm, I'm sure they're changing again now for the world's it's, changing. It's, it's fascinating. And like you said, I mean, as, as challenging as it is, it's also a big opportunity to create a, something new, a new model, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because there's nothing set in place already. Like right now there's a, there's a, you know, internal debate in special operations command about uh, changing the 12 man ODA to potentially yeah. a 16 man ODA. And this is like sacrilegious, you know, the 12 man right. ODA is like the ride or die for a lot of people. But yep. I mean, and I only bring that up just to talk about like institutionally how it's interesting that, you know, you're able to kind of like mold this block of clay. Yeah. Yeah. And to be at the team level, really, you know, my 
humble uh, contribution was really more at the tactical level mm -hmm. and being able to, you know, to contribute in that way. But there, were, I mean, some of my peers and mentors were really doing the hard struggle with big Marine Corps, you know, fighting for being able to be called Raider, re renaming the battalions, no small thing, fighting for the MOS and, and all of that. And of course, as a young enlisted dude, this is my, my chance to eat humble pie uh and it, in a live broadcast or a, in a in a large way like I, I was probably one of the complainers back then about all of that it's not happening fast enough and mm. it should be this should be that the device should look like this and all that and it worked out the right way and i i appreciate all of those uh yeah leaders who who fought for all of that ahead of me yeah i mean the the military is a huge ship that takes a long time to change its azimuth <laughs> yeah absolutely no, no getting around that um so tell us about, uh, you know, going into when, you, Ed, uh, I'm sorry, tripping over myself, but uh, when you uh, finally get orders to deploy as MARSOC mm -hmm. and what was that mm -hmm. like training up for that and then getting deployed for, uh, initially? The, that workup was probably one of the best and most comprehensive because it had the longest timeline and, and lead up to it. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably the most schools I got um in terms of like going to sniper school going to jump school and so on and so forth because they just all kind of fit in because we had the time to do it and then driving uh driving schools with your team and shooting schools with your team and, and all of those things um we were playing with a very funky model because we didn't know um how the command structure was exactly going to work above us so we still had marine corps tasking us and thinking they could task us all the way through the deployment along with SOCOM, you know, asserting, no, 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 no. They're ours once they deploy. They're, they're deploying under our deployment orders. And so my team uh, ends up uh, back on boats where they're not supposed to be. And I do half of my first deployment uh, with my team on a boat um, out in the, in the Pacific and heading towards, um, yeah, Asia. And it finally, over all of that, it was a little bit like uh, dad slap, slapping mom at the dinner table. Right. It was super awkward when SOCOM came over the top, called the boat and said, where's the commander? Hey, commander, get your team off the boat. Get them to Kuwait. We've already logistically planned all of that. Then you need to figure out how to get to Afghanistan where we told you to be three months ago. Ready, execute. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah. So but no, go ahead. We show up on the, you know, and we're taking up half the boat too, because we've got all of this cool guy SOCOM equipment. We've got vehicles and quad cons full of stuff. And we're taking up way more than our fair share of the boat because we're ready to world deploy. Um, but we didn't follow the basic orders, which was you're supposed to be in Afghanistan. So when we left the boat, the boat was happy. And when we left the boat, SOCOM was happy. The only one that wasn't happy was the Marine Corps, but <laughs> they got over it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not exactly the correct way to employ your brand new special ops unit to put them out of fleet like that. Um, yeah. So, so logistically, how did that work? Getting from from the ship to to Afghanistan. Lots of planes, trains, and automobiles. Lots of borrowing flights and flight space. Uh, got majority of the guys to Kuwait, and then got everything into. Uh, I'm pretty sure we were in Bastion. We we started in Bastion. Uh, got the whole company coalesced there and then spent the next three months doing, um, you know, because we show up late, you know, what do we, what do we give the guys who show up late? We'll give them whatever's left, right? So all the good jobs were taken. They said, you know, basically, why don't you guys go out West and disrupt? That's, <laughs> that's your mission statement. So that's what we did. We, we went out to Farah province where they told us to go and we disrupted. How did disrupting go? Disrupting was awesome. Uh, we did a lot of <laughs> we did a lot of driving around, waiting to be shot at, and just annihilating anybody dumb enough to shoot at us. Because we're you know we're in gun trucks. Uh, Fra Province was not full of IEDs yet. It was it was mostly uh, low level shooters, uh, low level fighters, I should say. Uh, so we weren't doing anything earth shattering by any means, but it was a great way to get our feet wet and mm -hmm. to really f shake out how do you operate in the desert with new Vicks, new guns and, and all the things. Yep. 
And so what did you think of the unit itself of like this unit that you, you know, you helped stand up even though you were a pretty junior guy and now you're getting mm. to see it in action. Um, what, what was that like? It was because it was such an entrepreneurial guys are leaving at any given moment. You never see them again, or even no one even talks about them. Like they're mm. just gone. Um, I was doing the best I could to keep my head down and just kick ass at whatever, any task I was given, do it better than was asked for. Um, but the caliber of humans I got to be around, I mean, so calm and being in the teams and I, it's interesting. I, I don't hear this talked about enough, but I find it fascinating is you run into all the genetic freaks, right? It's a, it's a gene pool of genetic freaks who end up in this one place. that are just super athletes who are also extremely intelligent. And so the level of conversation in the infantry, I would just say is a little different than the level of conversation in a team room uh, with a bunch of guys who have to have a standard IQ that's that's a little above the norm. Um, and so being around all of that made me raise the bar of my performance. Um, and I'm just, again, I don't know that I helped stand up. I, I can't claim that, but just being able to be there, like I just feel grateful, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, that must have been such a cool experience to like get to see it all come together after, you know, all of you guys put a lot of hard work into that, I know. Yep, absolutely. And then to see the way it's progressed, you know, watching the selection process come together and seeing literally bigger, stronger, faster, more intelligent young guys come into the unit. And you're like, oh, man, this whole thing's working. Like, this is working. Yeah. And so redeploying back home and then is it like getting ready to go back back into the breach it was it um You're once we kind cycle. of figured out that that initial uh hiccup if you will uh i that was afghanistan one of three and i pretty much the next one i hopped the rotation because i didn't i was still on the edge whether or not i was going to get to stay in the unit because i was uh not a recon marine and that was what it was predominantly fielded by we still didn't have an mos yet um, I was too senior to go to BRC. They were, you know, basic reconnaissance course, so they were not going to. They they had uh, they had no reason to let me in. They had every reason to let me fail, which I totally understand. Uh, and so um, I snuck away to some of the special schools because I had a, a team sergeant that looked out for me, a team chief that looked out for me, and said, "Hey, you know, we're just going to make you too valuable that they, you know, we're going to invest too much money in you, and they we're going to make it dumb for them to get rid of you." So I, I did some of those special schools. Uh, that are hard to get into and then like free fall like mm -hmm. you can't put a free faller out in the fleet like what's he going to do um and so i got very fortunate because i got taken care of by great leadership honestly mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh um in all of that um yeah it was just amazing experience and what was the what was the second uh trip to afghanistan like how did it differ from the first we actually knew what we we're doing <laughs> yeah, that made a huge difference, and we were given a legit mission. Uh, and so, um, we uh, VSO had just started, uh, mm -hmm. and we we got to be one of the first VSO teams. Not not popular, but it needed to be done and needed to be executed well. And so we ended up in a little village called Masao. And man, we took a ragtag group of uh, local indigenous. Uh, villagers and turn it into a police force and we built bridges and we built a school um we got to kick that school off before we left so we got to actually see like the first class start um you know dug some wells the the kind of the stereotypical stuff and we we made a you know it wasn't a it wasn't a quantum change but it was certainly a step change in the right direction um and it was uh yeah it was it was really good to be a part of and and to have you know we used to call it uh, season two, right? Season one is your right. first season, kind of like the TV shows. And so season two is just very different because you, you have a much better sense of, of what is right and wrong and what to do. And so we, we just operated much better and a lot of far more efficiencies, mm -hmm. I would say. How, how do you think the, uh, the Marines did transitioning from, you know, Hey, we're combat, we're meat eaters. And now, Hey, you're fighting a counterinsurgency. You need to make friends with the villagers. We're trying to build mm -hmm. up a security, uh, you know, uh, security apparatus around this area. Uh, what, what was that sort of transitional or, or if there was one, what was that like, um, for you guys? 
Yeah, I would say the general consensus at my level again. I was I was like a brand new E seven at that point, uh, gunnery sergeant, and everybody in you know, my my rank and below was like, "Nope, we're here to kill people." Like, <laughs> what are you telling us to do? <laughs> there's there's a war going on, and you want me to buy and sell goats and dig wells? Like, this seems like not the right job for us. Seems like a job for somebody else. Um, so it, it was not overly popular, uh, and uh, we were still looking to get in gunfights no matter what. Um, and so we pursued that uh, fairly heavily uh, <laughs> on the side while trying to, you know, train and, and do the right, th- train our indigenous forces to do the right things and, and all of that as well. So not not overly popular. Well, what was your, what were your thoughts by the end of the deployment? I mean, it sounds like you did make a tangible difference in that village. Mm-hmm. It was. I, you know, kind of like I alluded to that only in retrospect, you know, it's really hard to do when you're in the moment and you're hot, tired, eating, you know, terrible food and, and all of those things. And you, you just want to be in gunfights. Um, but to see a school open, right. And it was a burnt shell that was like literally just like ashes and to rebuild that and see the first class kick off and, and all of those things. It was like, you can look back and go, okay, like, I don't know if that school's still there, but, I mean, you guys did, did, the, did you, you did good while you were there. Yeah. 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 Um, and then uh, third trip to Afghanistan. How did that one differ from the previous two? Third trip was, um, I would say, the tactical pinnacle of, of my career by far. I got to be uh, on a commando team. So we're just doing raids uh, with uh, seven commando Kandak uh, out of Bastion. Um, all, all helicopter raids. So 72 hours ish was, was kind of the sweet spot to go, uh, into, you know, if a VSO, um, a village, uh, village stability operation was having a hard time cause they're doing the mm-hmm. handing out soccer balls and, and doing all of that stuff. And they're, they're having a hard time with, uh, fighters and IEDs and all those things. We'd go in and smash the problem for them. Um, and so that is just a lot of fun. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, and so finally getting to ride on black helicopters on a on a very regular basis, and then interfacing with, I mean, hats off to the one sixtieth. They're just what a what an amazing unit that is so professional, and totally made me rethink the way I approach how I speak to other units and how I coordinate with them because the professionalism yeah. that they showed uh, at every step of that. And in a small short story aside from that, we we had a guy that was injured. I happened to be injured at the, at the same time. It was a twisted ankle. My, my guys love, uh, beat me up about that, but they're like, well, you're the most useless. So you got to take this other useless guy and you're going to take him back to the, the hospital. So I ended up taking that ride. Uh, and I show up, you know, Kandahar and I have no idea. I get rid of my dude that I'm responsible for, uh, as a local national. And I, I kind of, and I don't know what to do next, but the Sodaf shows up and then right on the heels of the Sodaf is the 160th guys. And they're like, we got you, brother. Like, come get some hot chow with us. Like, we knew you were coming. We've been tracking the whole thing. And I go into the 160th talk. Coolest thing I've ever seen to this day. And, and one of the dudes uh, actually gave it to me at the end of the at the end of the operation. They were tracking on paper the entire operation and they were, they had my guys on, you know, cause you can listen to them on SATCOM yeah. and they're tracking every fighting position. They're tracking every gunfight. They're tracking every movement and everything that's happening on paper and on and because they're like, well, yeah, if everything, if we lose, you know, electricity or whatever else, like if, why, of course we do this, but it was just in like, we do it too in our own talk, but just to see the level of detail and care that was being done, amazing and they're like hey you want to go back like, yes get me out of here so they had a bird going back so you got to go back into the gunfight it was good <laughs> uh, any particular stories from that deployment that like stand out in your mind where you know you thought that you know your team really kicked some ass that day we had one particular gunfight we'd been in zone for it was um we'd been in an area where a bunch of the red dots had, had kind of come together yeah. so we were chasing red dots and there was some, some bigger red dots that were important there. Uh, and so it was, uh, my team and an ODA and to do a joint operation. And then I just happened to be in just one of the best gunfights of my career 
Um, and I'm, I'm a team chief, so I'm really just tagging along with my element leader who's doing all the, all of the real work. Um, and a hell of a dude, Madronzo, wherever you're at, I hope you hear this. You're a badass. Um, and he let me tag along, right? And so I'm supposed to be running the radio because I'm the GFC, um, the GFC for the, the gunfight and all that. But we get lit up pretty good. And we just happen to have a bird overhead. So we're like, oh, you boys aren't getting away with this one. And it was the first time I'm wearing uh, a Garmin and I can fully track everything that's going on. And we had great comms with the bird and like everything was just clicking and it was still daytime. So they're just, yeah, we tuned them boys up. Uh, we chased them for, then they didn't, they had no idea we we're chasing them. And so we ended up catching them boys and they had called in reinforcements. So we tuned up their buddies who came in to reinforce and then they made some phone calls and got some more buddies. And yeah, it just, it was, man, it was a great day. <laughs> Mayhem. Absolute mayhem. Yeah, I think we may or may not have stacked all of their motorcycles after we took care of them and lit it into a large pyre. It was great. Area pacified. Yes. It was very <laughs> quiet in that area after that. Yep. So, I mean, it's super cool that uh, to hear your story about going from being this young Marine on the rooftop watching the Jessica Lynch raid and like, now you are that guy. Mm. I mean, yeah, did, did, it, did it did it did it did it did it dawn on you like oh, I'm I'm here I'm doing it. I've honestly never thought about it that way until you just said that. Really, and it's surreal. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I'm a small town kid who grew up riding skateboards, and and then fast forward, I got to have these experiences, and yeah, it's amazing. Grateful <laughs> I got to do it. it you also, uh, uh, when we were talking earlier, you mentioned that you got to do some J sets with Marsock. Mm -hmm. Yep. So in between those Afghanistans, uh, we, we managed to find some time to go, uh, Philippines and some other places to do some J sets and work with, um, you know, local country, uh, police forces, ATFs, FBIs, and all of those, and really, you know, worked on their shooting capacity, working on their intelligence gathering capacities and all those things and doing the kind of the classic foreign internal defense kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And mm -hmm. yeah, and it was, it's a great way to kind of decompress from a, from a, a tougher deployment uh, from, from an Afghanistan to, to go do one of those. It's a little bit of an attaboy and still doing good work. Um, and talk to us a little bit about, I mean, we get up to uh, 2018, you know, the mm -hmm. years, the years are ticking by here. And I mean, you've had a pretty amazing career and it sounds like you had a hell of a lot of fun. Um, after, you know, that, those deployments, I mean, what's sort of like the next step for you? Yep. So I, I find myself, uh, too senior to have fun anymore. I find <laughs> myself riding a desk and, you know, future ops or somewhere upstairs in the S, you know, pick a number, probably the S three. And I'm, I'm coming to work one day. I'm a little bit late. Um, I'm, I've like spilled my coffee. I'm like trying to find my badge. Like where's, where's, how do I get it? You know, trying to get into the building. What's my code again? Um, I get to my cubicle and, you know, my left knee's hurting, my right shoulder's hurting. I'm already late for the first meeting and I'm like, Hmm, am I still here for the right reasons or am I now part of the problem? Hmm. And I spent the rest of the day, not really tuned into the meetings, but I realizing I was at like the 17 and a half year mark mm. and maybe 20 was the hard stop. Maybe, maybe it was time. Cause like I said, I. I saw the selection process working and the, the new young guys coming in were Jack studs, man. And they were smart. And so it felt, it felt like a good, a really good transition point at 20 years. So I started looking around. Um, I started really paying attention to, uh, my peers and mentors who are kind of a couple years ahead of me, you know, what are they doing? What's successful with what does success even look like? Mm -hmm. You know, what, did, what do they recommend and starting to have those conversations about, mm, I'm thinking about dropping my papers and all of those things which makes you super popular too, by the way, right? Uh, so you gotta be very careful how you have those conversations because no one no one wants to hear that you're a quitter, right? Um, but I start having those conversations and I really start realizing the, the longer the runway and the more my finances are locked down, that's going to predicate my best possible transition. So I started working on those things because that was in my sphere of control. 
And then on the weekends or at nights when I could go to a networking thing or something being put on by a, a veteran support organization, um, I would go do that. Um, and then what I got told, though, right around that same time, uh, the Honor Foundation was standing up and it was uh, primarily aimed at SEALs and SWIC uh, down in Coronado. Uh, and they had opened up the first couple seats uh, to Raiders and the first couple seats that went. And one of them happened to be one of my former commanders. Um, great guy, uh, Andy, wherever you're at, you did a hell of a job. Um, and then another guy, uh, Matt, um, one of my SEAs who still mentors me to this day and is a really good friend. They both said essentially the same thing. No matter what you do, you have to go through the honor foundation as your, that's your min force for infill to civilian life. If you don't do that, like you're, 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 you're making the wrong choices here. So follow the suit with that. Um, and so I'd, I had done a couple of other things. I, I had a resume I felt good about, and I had all of these other, I, I kind of figured out how to talk about myself a little bit and, and all these things. And then I, I'm in the seat very first night at, at the Honor Foundation, and the director says, okay, we've all introduced ourselves, all of that. You're going to introduce yourselves. And I'm sitting in the room with 30 other SEALs and SWIC, and there's the odd Green Beret in the background. Somehow, I don't know how he snuck in. and Because um, there's not a lot of Green Berets in Southern California. And... Uh, and it said, the director says, so check it out. You're going to introduce yourself, but here's the catch. You can't tell us your rank and you can't tell us what base or what you, you know, what you used to do. We want to know who you are, not what you did. Ready, go. And we're all just like, wait, what? What, what do you mean? So what, what did you, I'm what did you say? Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, I'm, I'm master Sergeant Halterman. Like I work yeah. in camp penalty, like all of these things. Right. And he, and he stopped us. He's like, don't worry. We know you don't know how to do that. Not yet that's what the next three months are about so then we i go through the program and I, it's just a absolute change i mean it's it's completely different than anything i experienced to that point and it is at the level that you would expect for socom like all of the things it takes you to get in and be and stay on the teams at whatever level this is the next logical step as you're transitioning to the next phase and it, it is at the level of professionalism and done in such a way that you're like, oh yeah, this is this is what it right looks like. So I finished that and I was ready to go be a tech entrepreneur. Like I knew that's what I was doing next. Um, and I got offered the opportunity to stay at the Honor Foundation as a staff member though. And they're like, we have a tech problem that we're trying to solve. You seem to have a propensity for it. Why don't you solve our hard, our hard tech problem and you know continue to serve? And I was like, yes, let's do it. I. Had, I had no idea I could have even had a chance to work here. Like, absolutely. Uh, so in September of 2018, I hit my 20 year mark. I got my DD 214. I'm retired. Uh, and then January 2nd of 2019, brand new civilian, brand new employee showing up at the honor foundation as a staff member. Yep. Wow. And what, what was that? I mean, it sounds, first of all, like you were very smart about how you transitioned out of the military and made a lot of really good choices to kind of set yourself up for success those last few years. Um, but nonetheless, I mean, uh, even more so for the Marines, that that's just like such a part of your core identity. I mean, what was it like when you finally got that DD-214 and, you know, leave the base for, you know, the last time in uniform anyway? Yeah, it is. It's another surreal experience especially if you do 20 years yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I'm sure even a 10 year or, or beyond um it, it's a surreal feeling because it at that point i had as much time in the marine corps as i had you know that that was half my existence yeah. on the planet um and a good chunk of that was spent in war and a good chunk of that was so it, it is a it is a it is the most mixed bag of emotions you can possibly have of joy excitement pure fear because yeah. you don't actually know what you're doing next right. not really right because you haven't done it yet right it's easy to talk shit about being a good gunfighter and then you go go get in a gunfight though um because training and and reality don't always match uh so all of those things are churning um and i was just trying to you 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 are correct i did the best i could with the information i had to make the best decisions to uh, posture myself for best possible outcomes. Yeah. You know, and if you're in special operations and you're transitioning, the honor foundation I would submit to you is, is that step. 
Well, yeah, let's let's take a moment right now. I'd love I'd love to hear you tell us. I mean, you talked about your interaction with Honor Foundation, but if you could kind of give us the elevator pitch or you know the thirty thousand yeah. foot view, like what is the Honor Foundation? What's their mission? What do they do? Sure. So the elevator pitch, and then I'll, I'm going to transition from that and give you kind of the real, real. Sure. The elevator pitch is it's a three month executive style education. And we're going to bring you in two nights a week. And if you're in a physical campus, uh, which we have eight of, you're, we're going to feed you dinner because we know you're coming from your challenging day job. We're going to ask you to be in civilian attire um, and business business casual at that, at that caliber. Um, we're going to feed you dinner because we, we know you haven't had time. Um, and we're going to have some interesting people in the room, anywhere from um, executive coaches to business owners to executives in corporate to entrepreneurs, and then you can just naturally have some conversations. And then from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., you're going to grind over the actual curriculum. Um, and then the doors don't close until the last person leaves. Might be a couple of a couple of drinks, but then you start to have sign of the the other conversations. Um, and you do it over the course of three months. Each phase or each month is a phase. Excuse me. So each phase is is one month long. And where we start, which makes the Honor Foundation very different from all other veteran support organizations, is we make you work on you. Mm. And so, you know, if you're wearing ranks and titles for a good chunk of your life, it's hard to remember who Jack is again. Yeah. And what does Jack actually like? And what does he actually want to what are you good at that you never want to do again? <laughs> That's a really good question to ask yeah. yourself in transition. So we work on a bunch of those things, a bunch of introspection. We don't let you flounder. We put you in a cohort of other like-minded high-performing individuals who are also in transition. So you've got, now you've got battle buddies or swim buddies, you know, depending on um, who we're serving. And, uh, and then we give you an executive coach that you've got to check in with once a week, who's a civilian more often than not, who's volunteering who's going to help you figure out your transition because your needs are going to be a little bit different than mine, even though we're both, we could both be E8s getting out 20 years, been in gunfights together, all the things you may have kids and you're moving back to New York and I'm single and I want to go be at Google, right? Those are just right. very different outcomes. And to facilitate that, we give you a coach so that you can get really down and in on what those individual needs are. So mm -hmm. broad curriculum that helps everybody with individual one-to-one -one care, if you will. And then the big proposition without going into all the rest of it is we serve you for life. Once you graduate with us, um, you're in a growing population. There's 2,550 plus alumni right now. So if you're looking to get in a company, as soon as you graduate, you have access to a ranger or somebody at Google, you've got a access to a SWIC or a SEAL who's an entrepreneur in the industry you want to be in and on and on and on. If it's a company you've heard of, we probably have a connection to it at this point, either directly through one of our graduates or through our great supporters, or the company is actually donating to us or, or a myriad of other things. That's the elevator pitch. But I'll tell you what we're really doing. And we never expressly say it. We're helping guys deal with identity, community, sense-making, purpose, and meaning in life when the uniform comes off. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And because even though you're going to have to do a really long checklist to get out of Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, or Space Guardian, and you're going to have to do another really long checklist to get out of your individual unit, and you're going to have to do all of these things for medical, and you're going to have to do all these things for the VA, and you're going to get a job, None of that is transition. That's change management. Right. That's all that is. Transition happens in your heart and in your head. It's how you feel about all of those things. It's how you make sense of it. It's how you figure out who you are and who your new team is going to be. And then what is my purpose? And how am I going to find meaning from all of that now? Because if you're wearing the uniform, all of those things are answered. Like, instantly and then it's gone so that's what we really try and help guys and gals grapple with i'm really glad to hear you say that so explicitly and that the foundation helps guys with with that issue with those that series of issues um because you know i i've been out long enough now what 14 years long enough to kind of mm. reflect back on the, on my own transition experience and i mean i really think that 
you know, we'll take special ops guys, for example, you have to fight as hard to transition as you did to get into that unit. You know, like you, you, you talked about your fight, you know, that to get into special operations, that was a big uphill battle for you. Um, in my opinion, it's just as big a battle to transition out of the military and find that purpose and, and find that identity that you mentioned. Absolutely. And hey, it's hard. Yeah. Like, I, I'm just like, if anybody's listening, you're not there yet, but you're thinking yeah, about yeah. transition. Yeah, it's hard. But that's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. It was hard to get in. It's going to be hard to get out. And the, the things that are the most meaningful to us in life, the things that have the highest amount of value are the things that we had to struggle through, that we had to grind over, and that we eventually found a solution to. So when you do it and you do it right, it'll be one of the most gratifying things that you, one of the most gratifying things you accomplish. Um, no, this, it's super cool. And it sounds like right now the Honor Foundation serves the special operations community. I mean, is there a specific... We are 10 years old, uh, and that's that is our that's what we are chartered chartered to do as a national 501c3 uh, nonprofit. Um, the dream or the vision, really not dream, the vision has always been though to serve. How do we effectively make a bigger impact than that? Uh, and so the vision has always been: what would it look like for us to take our knowledge? And look, we do all the other things too. We do resumes and we do LinkedIn because all of those things are required. You, you have to have all of those things to get in and through a hiring funnel, start your own company, or go, go on and be a college student for a while. And those mm -hmm. are kind of the three big buckets most guys, gals fall into. But how do we, how can we contribute to the greater 200,000 who get out of Army, Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps in mass every single year? And so we think the unique area that we can provide uh, a real meaningful difference is in the areas I talked about, working on identity, community, sense making purpose and meaning in life. Because we really feel like that's an area that's not being touched at all because everything is focused around the necessity of getting in and through a hiring funnel or getting to a school or starting your own company. But to do that effectively, knowing who you are first, starting with the self we, we would submit to you, is the best place to start. And so we're currently piloting a program. We have a, about 100 uh, pilot participants right now from a wide swath of military experience who are in the transition process. They're going through this um, uh, curriculum with us right now. And once we get done with that, we're looking at launching uh, and making it available potentially in May of this year to all wow. transitioning veterans uh, so that we're really giving them that, you know, we would call it phase zero. Like here's, here's the initial step you need to take before you can navigate to a point, you have to know where you are. So let's help, let us help you figure out where you are. And now you can plot a course with all these other great foundations who've already figured out best in class, you know, building the best LinkedIn, building the best, uh, community, you know, bunker labs already figured out how to do entrepreneurship and we're going to hand you off closer to a whole human who knows who they are mm -hmm. so you can chart a better path. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds incredible. Um, and you said you served, uh, or the Honor Foundation served 700 uh, troops last year. Yeah, um, we served, yeah, about 700. We will serve about 800-ish, uh, you know, depending on how it goes this year of, of special operations individuals. Yeah, and that's Army, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, JSOC, uh, and enablers. And what has your role been at the at the company since you took the job there? In 2019, I got hired to be the virtual director. It was the very first virtual campus. So I got to be director of the fourth campus uh, in existence at that time. Um, and it was literally figuring out, is it possible to deliver high-quality content over Zoom or over another digital medium so that we can scale it and do it for, you, you know, we've got uh, guys and gals in SOCOM who are all over the map, not co-located with a base. And we hadn't, we hadn't really grown at that point yet either. And so we knew it was a, a capability we needed. Um, and so I got to prove the concept. Uh, I got to, there was already pretty much an 80% solution that was handed to me by, it's people that did much harder work than I had to do to figure out a lot of the base uh, stuff. All I had to do was get over the goal line. 
Uh, and so figuring out, yes, it is possible to deliver uh, high value, high touch, quality content over Zoom is possible, although we all now hate it because of 2020. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's just the reality of the world we live in. But it was fortuitous right. in that I got to figure it out in 2019 so that when 2020 happened, the entire company was able to pivot and we served about 200 more service members in 2020 awesome. than, we, than we did in 2019 because of a, uh, the team just going, okay, Halty, uh, you already figured this out. Like, how do we do it? And just having great team members, just like in special operations, who know how to feel, flow, and go, make it happen. Uh, do we have any questions for Mike? Uh, we, do. Hold on. we have a, one of the interesting things about doing these interviews live is some of the viewers chime in with some questions. Uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, please, D. Thank you. Jackson asks, do you ever foresee a MARSOC tier one element being stood up kind of like Delta Force, but for Raiders, or is it unlikely? Oh, man, that's a great question and so contentious. <laughs> um, spicy. It's, it's a spicy question. Yeah. yeah, that is a spicy one. And I'm, I'm thankful to not be in uniform and be able to answer this honestly. Um, you know, it, it's been talked about since uh, the, the very early days. Um, and uh, we we do have an allocation and an opportunity to uh, go that direction uh, under other already formed JSOC um, commands. Uh, currently, um, in terms of the future, that's a that's a big, you know, it's easy to say uh, the men are capable. It's easy to say have the experience. It's hard to say that is standing up something very different. That is also a, a big budget. Somebody much higher than any decision maker and the DOD is going to have to make and, and all of those things. So I don't know the actual reality of that. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful though. Cause I, I think I definitely worked with some, um, genetic freaks <laughs> who are also highly intelligent and would fit in over there. And there, there might be one of one or two of them over there right now. That's it for that's, the questions. That's... I have a question. Yeah. So we heard from uh, journalist Matt Cole, who wrote the book Code Over Country, that mm. at some point during the GWAT, um, I guess SOCOM or JSOC was wanted to uh, bring in like a bunch of Marines into BUDS and mm. like flood BUDS with Marines. I remember this story. Do you know anything about that? Have you like Was that something that came across your radar when you were there? No, that's the first time I've ever heard that. And I don't know if I'm, I don't know if that's awesome or terrifying or a bit of both. Like, <laughs> no, uh, I mean, the closest thing that I had an experience, it's, and it's, uh, it's only mildly close to that was, uh, 18 Delta got opened up to us for like a heartbeat. Mm -hmm. Um, and I got to be on a short list to potentially go to 18 Delta. And then, uh, that got shut down very quickly because, when you talk about how do you how do you sustain that over long periods of time and and all of those things we had i think the command had no answers for that and so it, it, that got shut down so what's uh what's next for you mike what's the next step in uh, your transition i guess you're transitioned out now but in your civilian career and life what's mm -hmm. the next step for you yeah so after after having the privilege of being a director and, and serving cohorts for about two and a half years. And I, I transitioned into being the uh, vice president of operations. So I've been doing the super sexy behind the scenes stuff like insurance and HR and IT. I mean, just the really cool stuff. Everyone, when you get out, wants to go do. <laughs> um, and I, I say that obviously because a knuckle dragon door kicker infantryman like myself is probably the wrong choice, but I have an amazing CEO who lets me run with scissors. Uh, so thank you, Matt. You're awesome. Um, and he's let me figure out uh, a lot of things. And so I've, I've pseudo gotten an OJT MBA, uh, along the way and learned a ton, uh, some of it the hard way, most of it the hard way. Um, and I, I really enjoy, I get to be the one person now, uh, second person on the team. Cause I, I have a teammate who's joined me in ops in, in earnest. So she is, She's kind of like current ops and I'm doing future ops as best as possible. Um, and uh, we're the two people on the team who really get to focus on the team. 
because most of the team are kind of inside culture or, or motto is fellows first. And the fellows are the ones who are in transition going through the cohorts. And we do everything for the fellows, like no matter like if we've got to pay for it or if we've got to bring in a world class instructor, you know, we, we don't have special operations guys teaching LinkedIn. We have LinkedIn professionals teaching, you know, and, and for all the classes. So we put fellows first and because the team does that, they they burn themselves out and they they work extremely hard. I mean, it's it's really no different than a, a special operations team. I mean, they work really hard. So being able to focus on the team, trying to make their lives easier, that is very meaningful to me. And if I can get little wins for them to make their lives easier, like that's, I'm still really enjoying that. So I, I kind of don't see myself leaving anytime soon. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, Mike, I mean, I really appreciate you coming on the show and I really appreciate what you're doing today and, uh, and what, what the honor foundation's up to. Um, I'd actually never heard of them until tonight. So um, I'm going to have to pr uh, push that out to people when people ask me yeah. and friends are transitioning out of the military. I'm going to have to make sure to mention this to them. Yeah, I appreciate you putting it up on the screen, too. If anybody wants to learn more, we, ha we have a, a ton more information on there. I literally touched like the snowflakes at the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more to it. And I'm hoping in May of this year, we're going to have a big announcement. Do you, wa you want to give the uh, website for the listeners uh, who check out the podcast? Absolutely. H-O-N-O-R dot O-R-G. That's honor.org. Hopefully it's up on your screen right now. If you go check that out, it gives a lot more information on the program. And if you're interested in getting involved, uh, there's, there's a lot of different ways to get involved. Uh, there's some easy ways to sign up as a volunteer if that's interesting to you. If you've been working in corporate, if you're an entrepreneur, if you've been working in finance, if you've managed a hedge fund, those are all things mm -hmm and opportunities and industries that guys and gals who are transitioning are looking at. And they would love to have a conversation with an individual like you so they can understand that. And it's one of the big things we push is don't just research it online, which is also important, but go have a conversation with somebody who's doing it nine to five and find out what they're actually doing each day before you say you want to be at SpaceX. Cause you might get yourself into something you're not ready for <laughs> with your three kids and, and all the rest. So, um, if you're, you know, if you're out there, you're a great American and you've been, uh, working hard in the, uh, private sector. And if, and if you're a veteran and, and you've been doing the same, love to have you, uh, come contribute as a volunteer. Yeah. And you can find the, uh, the links down in the description and the show notes, if you're listening or watching, Definitely. So it's right there for you. Um, thank you, Mike, any, any final thoughts? Is there anything I failed to ask that you really want to talk about no, I really appreciate this opportunity. I mean, I, I see the caliber of people that you have on here, so I'm a little bit shocked. Yeah, uh, you allowed me on here, so I, I just really appreciate it. Yeah, no, you're welcome anytime. And like I said uh, earlier, if you know the Honor Foundation's having an event and some of the guys are coming through New York City, we'd we'd love to have you guys here. That'd be awesome. Absolutely, we'll get together and smoke some of those cigars. Yeah, hell yeah, absolutely. And uh, next uh, episode, next Friday, we're going to have uh, Travis, who served as a special operations weatherman, weather technician. Uh, Jack's dream come true, we, finally. Yeah, we've been, ta we've been talking about it. it. You know, it always comes up, you know, and usually it, there's a joke being made about special yeah. ops weathermen. And we, yeah. I figured instead of making the joke, let's actually have one of these people on here and talk about their profession and what they do. Bro. Quick story. I will not make a joke about those guys ever because my very last jump was into the Yellow Sea uh, on the border between North and South, obviously pretty far south of, of the border, but it was in the Yellow Sea. This guy figured out the weather, like pulling six years of data, and he called the weather to a T. It was exactly what he said it was going to be, and we were able to jump. It was amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. That's the kind of stuff I want to hear. Like I said, yep. it's, it, it's interesting to learn about career fields that you knew nothing about before. Um, yep. So I will never talk trash about them. Yep. Good dudes. <laughs> awesome. All right. So, Mike, thank you. Thank you, everyone, who joined us tonight. And uh, we will see you next Friday. Take care out there and have a nice weekend. Thank you.